tuned for The Joan Quinn Profiles. As an editor for Andy Warhol's interview, the Los Angeles Herald Examiner, LA Style, and Detour Magazines, Joan covered the social set, the Hollywood hotshots, the international art scene, the mysteries of food, the excitement of travel, and the fabulous world of fashion. Joan continues to find creative people on the cutting edge who make things happen. Here's Joan Agajanian Quinn. Hi, I'm Joan Quinn, and welcome to the Joan Quinn Profiles. Our guest is architect Frank Gehry. Frank was raised in Toronto and moved to Los Angeles in 1947. He received a Bachelor of Architecture from USC and studied city planning at Harvard University Grad School of Design. He seems to us a rebel in the field, experimenting with all kinds of offbeat materials, solving problems in ways that go against the norms, and yet with his profound and brilliant work, Frank creates spaces that address the context and the culture of the site. How do you address culture and context? What does that mean? <laughs> well, we're all part of a scene of some sort. We all live in here. And uh, I, like any artist or person making a commentary, like a writer, <clears throat> you talk about what you're s surrounded with. And, uh, you know, you could look at it and say, oh, no, I don't like this city. I don't like what it looks like. I, but you can't change it that quickly. I mean, on my lifetime, for example, you can't change it. So uh, I've tried to look at it. What is it? What is there about it? Why is it like this? And I guess for myself, I decided that it's democracy. It's about, you know, we have that form of government that we like, <laughs> 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 that uh, um, allows a lot of freedom. And the freedom has led to this expression, our city. And, but is, and, it all, uh, is it always just the city, or does it have to do with the smaller site? Or is it, does, yeah, is it all but it's involved? all basically uh, intrinsically part of the city, and and uh, so I try to look at the chaos of our city and try to relate to it, not to pander to it, but to understand what's good about it. Like with the chain link, it was horrible. I hate chain link, but uh, everybody was using it. Everybody was denying they had it in their houses, in their tennis courts, right in front of their living room, uh, and because Bob Irwin did those scrim pieces, I thought, well, chain link is a scrim. You can make it pretty, you can do stuff. And I started playing with it, which then made people upset because the, the, the denial mechanism was so strong, they didn't want to know about it. But, but that gets that's into how those, I get into trouble. <laughs> that, 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 that not only got you into trouble, but that also got us into these experimental kinds of materials, um, which also, I guess, is part of that context you're talking about. You yeah, saw like chain link everywhere, like so you started... Cardboard is being made in such great quantities. It's a throwaway. Uh, and I started looking at it and seeing if there was something good about it. And I found some good about it, and I used it that way. But th that's what I do. But it's, <laughs> it's, it's sort of, I, I say it's like getting on the train. The train is moving, that's the culture. And oh. you get on, you accept what's on there, and you make do with it and sort of turn it into something. Does every building that you build have to have those ingredients that like the context or of the city or the culture of the city? If you're building a house for someone, do you also address it in that situation? Yes, very much. The Schnabel house that I did <coughs> in uh, Brentwood, I mean it's a fairly wealthy area, but uh, <coughs> the houses around it you can see from everywhere on the lot. You can't escape the, your neighbors, their architecture. You may not like it, but you can't escape it. I wanted to make the building a part of that. You, it had to be. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can screen it out with plants, but it takes a few years to do that. I see. So I was trying to include, it's, it's an optimist, I think it's an optimistic idea. You, you include your neighbors. You, you don't include, well, you did also a series of three houses put together in Wayzata. Minnesota, right, and our show goes to Minnesota, so ah. they're probably watching us in Wayzata. But that had no houses around it. So right. how did you address that situation? Well, that was <coughs> a little different can of worms. This is a, a large estate, 
with the house by Philip Johnson. Uh, the people wanted to build a guest house. Philip Johnson did not want to, at this stage in his life, design a guest house. He didn't recommend me, but he didn't want to do a guest house. To bring in an architect to copy Philip Johnson would trivialize Philip Johnson's, the strong building that he has there. Mm -hmm. So the, these people are savvy in the art world, savvy about art, and savvy about architecture, uh, said, we've got to find some other uh, way of dealing with this. They thought they should build, because if they build a new house, it looks like they're subdividing. Right. So they wanted something that looked like it was part of, that didn't copy the, and trivialize the Johnson. And so we landed on this idea that, since they are art collectors, they collect sculpture, that this, these buildings could look like a sculpture mm -hmm. sitting in the garden. But you used a lot of strange materials, those experimental materials. No, again, I, I used... Uh, <laughs> those I used, weren't strange anymore. No. They're mainstream. <laughs> <laughs> well, no, it's not. I used uh, the brick from the Philip Johnson building for the fireplace, uh -huh. so there was an echo back. Uh -huh. I used uh, metal. Uh, I wanted to use lead copper or something like that, uh -huh. but lead copper is now toxic. People, uh -huh. you're not allowed to use it. Um, so we used a painted, factory painted metal, dark, and we used uh, local stone, the Mankato stone, which I love. And then I did use one strange material. What was it? The plywood, finished plywood. I was just going to ask you, I, yeah. I knew there was wood there. No, yeah, <laughs> and that plywood is precarious. I used it on Loyola Law School. I've used it on a few buildings. It's not recommended as a exterior material. Um, but it's used for form lumber in all over Europe. Mm. And it's exposed to ultraviolet, and it's used against concrete, and it's used many times. And so I, I, I was fascinated about this material. It was so strong and unbeatable in terms of that use, as uh, why it couldn't be used for building. And it's so rich, and I started to use it. And did it work? It works in Minneapolis, and I suppose it works there because they don't have the sun strength oh. they do here. In, L in think, L.A. it doesn't work. I would think that the snow and the rain and all of that would be harder on it than the sun. No, it's not. Isn't it's, that? So you just amazing. have to put those things and out. The, and the Wintons, who own that house, are in the lumber business, p part of their business. And so they, they were, were, you know, complicit. They knew what we were, the risk we were taking. The, um, we've talked about all these buildings all over that you've built. And you, as a young boy, were in Canada. Did you build things when you were a youngster? Well, I, I didn't know I wanted to be an architect till very late. That's what I wondered. Did you, were, you no. never did that? Except my grandmother and I used to play on the floor when I was about nine years old with, blo with cuttings <laughs> from the, the wood shop around the corner. She used to get to, for the wood fire in her stove and we would make these cities and fantasize about them. It's funny because Charles Ruiz, who is our artistic director here, said, I want to know if he played with blocks on the floor. I did, yeah. This was even I better, did, though. But I then, <laughs> and, and when I got to be 18 and 19 and started to realize I had to do something for a living, and soon to make <laughs> up my mind, uh, the, the issue of what to be and how to proceed was very messed up. I mean, I had a, it was a bad time for my family. And uh, I remembered that one of the nicest things I ever did was play with these blocks. And I said, maybe, maybe I should try something in that arena. Really? And it was just an intuition. Huh. I was lucky, too. Did you think you would draw? <laughs> or were you going to be an artist? No. Nope. I mean, I... I loved art. My mother took me to the museum in Toronto when I was a kid. And I loved art. And I... And you know me well enough to know that I have put painters on the highest pedestal. I think they're above human, and I, I treat them like that, which is bad. I know you do, because you have such great respect, but I think, in turn... So I they, would never paint. <laughs> you would never paint, but no. they think of you in the same way, because their work is enclosed in a building, and your work is what encloses that. Right. And I think you're probably the best kind of person to work with an artist because you want their work to show the best. Right. 
But your work is art on the outside as <laughs> you're driving down the street. I mean, do you it's ever... Become, uh, be, say, <clears throat> people say that, I guess. I know, but do you ever drive around and say, oh my gosh, that look at my piece. I mean, does it ever shock you when you see, see your work? Mm, no. <laughs> it doesn't? You no. Just... But see, you've got to understand that my logic systems I, that I've built up over the years uh, seem very normal to me. So yeah. everything I do seems very normal, and I can't understand why people think it's it's strange or different. Or rebellious, that's what yeah, I like. Yeah, because it doesn't make sense in my head. That, I see. Uh, now afterwards, I mean, it's happened enough times that I'm not naive, so I, I say, yeah, I guess they got a point, and I try to figure it out now, but... Well, that, um, figuring out what you were doing has gotten you, like, I don't know, hundreds, almost a hundred awards from one situation to more another. Than, more than anybody deserves in a lifetime. No, no, <laughs> including since 1967, you've been getting awards. Like, right. I think the Meriwether Post Award for AIA, the Merit Award was your first one. Right. That's right. And up to the Pritzker. Well, you did your homework. I did. The Pritzker, <laughs> the Pritzker, which is, I mean, the biggest honor I think an architect can. Does the world know how, what good friends we are? <laughs> <laughs> are they allowed to know? Well, I want them to know how good you are. Okay. <laughs> but to get the Pritzker, I think, is is it a dream of every architect, or do you just, um, well, it just I, uh, falls on you? I always take it at things that fall on me. <laughs> and I always, and I'm, here's where I may be a bit disingenuous because I, I like to think about it that, that way that oh the guy called me and said in fact when he called me I was in Holland in Amsterdam this was in 1989 you got I print. was in Amsterdam visit at the uh, I'd <coughs> gone to the concert at the Concertgebouw with Ernest Fleischmann because we had just started working on Disney Hall and uh, great concert I went to bed phone rang it was Bill Lacey saying you've won the Pritzker and I said, Bill, it can't be true. Uh, Venturi hasn't gotten it yet. And I, <laughs> I said, I got to go to bed. Don't bother me. <laughs> he said, it's true. When you wake up in the morning, call me. Oh. Well, of course, I hung up and away, tried to sleep, and I couldn't. And I realized he must have been telling the truth. But it's not for one building. Is it for your whole compilation of work? Yeah, they say that's for a life's work. Yeah. It's for the life's work. Not and then the terrible thing they do to you when you win those awards is guess what they do? They put you on the jury. <laughs> for, and then the, you, for the next person? You've got to pick the next guy. It's oh, terrible. that's great. That's great. And then you look at their whole body of work. Is that what you yeah. do? And you go through their whole lifetime. Yes. Do you visit? Do they do side you visits visit, of your yes. work? You meet the people. You do look at their work. You go to their offices. It's pretty thorough. And it's over a year. Uh, you travel around. Mr. You, Pritzker has a nice plane, and you just fly around. Is that right? Yep. Oh, can anyone? Don't, don't they need lay people on the jury? <laughs> <laughs> you know, you were talking about travel, traveling for the Pritzker, but traveling um, in Japan and Europe and uh, America, you've built, ho you've built houses, commercial buildings, museums, um, things all over. Has the traveling taken its toll? I got older, you know. <laughs> Is it hard? It's hard, yeah. What do you do when you get to a city? Do well, first of all, I get on the plane and I, I only have caviar and <laughs> vodka. Really? Period. Because I love it. <laughs> and it's a treat. So that makes it something, the cold vodka and the caviar. And then I don't eat any more and I just take a sleeping pill and go to sleep. When you get to the country or the wherever you're going, are there different pitfalls in each place? Say when you're working in Japan, is it different than working in Prague or Spain? Yeah, the Japanese is the hardest because we don't understand them. We think we're talking and they're telling us things and we're telling them things. And it's like ships that pass in the night. They really are difficult. It's really difficult. Uh, it's difficult for them with us and for us with them. And what did you do? You did a, um, a restaurant, a, a big restaurant. fish restaurant, or a big fish restaurant. Was it, it was a restaurant a, with a big fish on yeah, it? Yeah, but it, I never wanted to do that. It was a, just a series of misunderstandings. It would take too long to explain. Is that right? But it, it just, uh, they asked me to do a drawing on napkins, and I made a little drawing with, uh, like those, yes. I have a little drawing <laughs> on a napkin. <laughs> and, you know, architects do that all the time. So they asked me to do, after a lot of sake one night, they asked me to do a little drawing, and I made 
little drawings like that, and, the, and they said, please, Gary San, make a drawing with a fish, because they knew I was interested in that. And of course, Japan is very fish or boys, fish oriented. Um, so I made uh, some waves and a little fish. And I gave it to them, and I left Japan. I came back ready to start work. About three weeks later, they sent me a complete set of drawings, like architectural drawings based on my sketch, oh, that's <laughs> and said, congratulations, you won the competition. Well, I didn't know I was in a competition, first of all. Mm -hmm. I didn't know that this was the way we were going to design it. And, and finally, we couldn't build what was on that sketch. It wasn't, oh. it wasn't possible, and I kept telling them it wasn't. But they insisted that the fish be in it. So it was a series of misunderstandings, but but you, you well intent. I mean, great experience working with them. You did um, do fish lamps and fish accessories, mm -hmm. and um, we have fish for you today because we know you're a Pisces on our chair. You did that just for I me. I did it just for you. <laughs> <laughs> Kathleen Spiegelman sent over the fish. But when we come back, we're going to take a break. When we come back, we're going to talk to you about Disney Hall the Weissman Museum, Bilbao, the American Center. We have a lot of pictures to see. Great. So we'll be back in a minute. Don't go away. Frank Gehry will be back with us after the break. I'm Joan Quinn, and we're back with architect Frank Gehry. Frank talked about some of the work that he did, the architecture that he did, and in the late 80s, people thought enough of him, I think, the walker to begin with, put together a show with Mocha to show some of his work in a museum situation. It went to Toronto, Minneapolis, uh, Los Angeles, it was at the Whitney, went to Houston. Did you feel like the ultimate artist at that point? <laughs> <laughs> I, I tend to be terribly aw shucks guy, you know. I mean, it's probably fake as can be, but I I love, you know. I you was, love the attention. I mean, it was the great. The thing is, they built your buildings inside of these museum walls, which was so great. You yeah. got to go in and see the way things it worked. Was, uh, it was a nice idea that they let me build construction, so you could get a sense of what a building felt like. And use those materials. I mean, some of the walls were yeah. totally cardboard. Your cardboard furniture was in it. Right. The, the so Noel chairs weren't in it yet, because no, the Noel chairs were new. I hadn't done those yet. No, it was a great experience. And then I got to design the show in every venue. So So each installation was different. Different, yeah. That's what was so great. Kept you me know, busy. Earlier, Frank, we talked about your drawings on little napkins. And I have this wonderful drawing ah. of uh, Disney Hall. This doesn't look like anything. It looks like a piece of art. It looks like a drawing that you, you might frame and put on the wall. And that probably is what you were talking about with the fish when you said it, it was a fish, but it didn't work. Right. And this drawing then turned into this. Yeah. But I, uh, I work out my thoughts uh, in the drawings. And, and it's like trying to drag the ideas out of the paper. I don't know. And I do tons of them. And they only make sense after you see the building. So, so when you look at, when you see the building built, and then you get a... Should I hold them together? You could. It's, it's sort of, you get the energy, they're like sails, and these are like sails. And, and so it gives me a, a representation to, to try and accomplish in mortar and bricks and stone. So Disney Hall is uh, a project that's happening in downtown Los Angeles, part of the Music Center. Yes, it's, a, it's the most extraordinary experience working with the musicians. And getting that sound. You mentioned earlier you were in Amsterdam when you were called about your Pritzker <laughs> work. Did you go all over the world listening to that? Yeah, and it's, it's really, I mean, it's, it takes hours to explain, but you, f you realize, fine, I mean, I just had one experience that would make it clear. I, I had dinner a few months ago with three young ladies who play in the chamber orchestra in Los Angeles, and they'd been to Royce Hall, and I asked them, what they thought of Royce Hall. And one said, oh, it's just great. I loved it. The sound was perfect. The other one said, I hated it. <laughs> and I said, where did you sit? And she said, oh, just two seats over from her. And then the third one said, 
it was all right. It was, you know, so it was like the little bears, and, and Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby. What you realize is that it's it's pretty ephemeral, and it's more than the building. And with Solonen, we were able to move the orchestra around one or two times in a, in an experiment, and he showed me that he could change the sound of the whole orchestra in any room by 30 percent. So you can. You can, uh, it's got to be a good day. The room has to be nice to be in. It has to be comfortable for the musicians and comfortable for the, the audience. There has to be good contact, you know, with the, with the people. The music has to be good. The conductor has to be good. <laughs> and this is what you design. <laughs> and that's what you get. So it's a, it's a... But even once it's built, and this and then it they takes open, two, what takes, happens takes then? a year to two years, they say, to learn to play in it. Uh. So it's like a new instrument. You have, people have to realize that. It's like they have to learn to where they sit and how to melt, balance the sound. You depend on the orchestra, not so much your building then. Well, Do you give the building the perfect, they, all the perfect? We have an acoustician who tells you how many square cubic feet of air you need mm -hmm. for this size and so on. <laughs> uh, for instance, they told us they wanted that it was precarious to design a hall over 2,200 seats. Mm -hmm. Well, the Philharmonic wanted 2,500 seats because mm. of the economics. So we got the bright idea that if we made a hall that had 2,200 seats and then squeezed in as many as we could, would that work? And they th they love that. So that's what we did. So what we're about up this? Is this squeezing in the sides and behind the orchestra? The only squeezing in we did was adding a balcony, which Ernest and the orchestra didn't want balconies because they feel it makes second class. Uh, but in Berlin, is it in Berlin? Ber this is patterned after Berlin. Which was the greatest music hall I'd ever well, been Well, it's great. So you sit right on the orchestra. But it's a great, from a, an experience, from an audience participating with the orchestra. That's what I loved. You wonderful. were right there. And then the people behind had a different kind of a, a view. Yeah. I felt I was the closest to the orchestra of any country or any music hall I'd ever been in. Well, Sharoon, the architect for Berlin, had it something about people, humanism in his hands. It so was great. It was great. great. And we have so I, I want to show this to The American Center, Paris, just completed. Just completed. It took a long time. Yeah. <laughs> There's, it's a dance studio inside. There's a museum inside. There's a theater. I think you have a picture. Next, uh, this go. is the Which foyer. Way does this go? That's is this right? I think it's this way. Oh, right. Uh, it's just looking up in the skylight just to give you an idea of the space. And then the next picture is the theater. It's oh, here's the theater. And I'm really pleased. We designed this theater from the uh, performer's point of view because it's, it's an experimental theater, and uh, we'll do avant-garde work, and so it's... it's so Peter Sellers looked at it, wants to do something there, so that's... So it looks like a great theater. I is. mean, the idea is you either work from your point of, uh, the musician's well, it's gonna be, point of view, or the people's you point can, of you view. You can do both, but this, <laughs> we really focused on what it feels like to be a performer on that stage, and how they contact with the notion that if you do that, they're going to play better and be better I see, I see. and engage better. Here's another one. This is the Frederick Wiseman uh, Museum in Minneapolis. It's a small art museum. It's my first art museum from scratch, actually. Is that right? Yeah. It's tiny. It's like an $8 million building. And these are the galleries. Uh, Freddie, who I think is very sick or gone from this world, I don't know, very, he's very ill right now. But he's really with us in this building that he, you he, made. He made this, <laughs> Alan, he, he, he came from Minneapolis. Yes. So he wanted to give something. You have a very close, close tie to Minneapolis too, I don't know why. Don't the know. walker, I mean it feels like you belong Well there. I grew up in Canada, so yeah, maybe that's... Maybe. <laughs> and this is the... Uh, that's the Wiseman Museum, it's a stainless steel and it faces west and at night the sunset reflects in the building. Is that what That's that is? And it comes alive. It's quite. This is at the uh, university, isn't it? University of Minnesota. We have. Um, we're running out of time quickly, but I want to show. This is a building that was in uh, Switzerland. Basel. It's a small office building for Vitra, who make furniture, and I design furniture for them. Do you? Yeah. 
Can we tell? You say the different colors and the is this whole building yours? The whole building's mine. So it's you have very hard to explain in thirty seconds, but it's it's an office building and this is a conference center. And you enter into the office building through the conference center. Mm. Okay, and I have one more before we go because I think this one is fabulous. And it's Prague. This oh. is the <laughs> <laughs> That's where I'm going this week. Uh the building is on the river, and it was a site that was bombed accidentally by an American bomber in World War II, oh. February. Uh, so was it 45. leveled? It was leveled, and the house next to it is owned by the Havels. Oh. And Vassal Havel lives there, or used to. I'll just and show these as, we're, as you're talking. This building is now under construction. It's a small office building. It was very precarious to build in the 19th century uh, with all the uh, with all of the 19th century, so beautiful <laughs> and so uh, delicate, you don't want to hurt it. And yet, uh, Havel didn't want me to do a copy. He wanted a modern building. He wanted something special. This is great. I had one other thing, and it was Bill Bow. Oh, I think I dropped it. Let me get it. <laughs> 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 because I think Bilbao is fabulous. It's like a whole city you did. It's a, this is it here. It's the um, uh, Guggenheim Museum is, is building a branch, I guess you would call it, in Bilbao, Spain. The Basque government made a deal with the Guggenheim to uh, build, they paid for the building and they asked Tom Krenz to help them develop a collection that would be unique and theirs which would bring artist friends of yours and mine over to do work. Uh, I don't know which ones, but, um, but we'll, I'm not, <laughs> we'll, we'll, we'll lobby we'll later. We'll work it out today, and we'll send them all over to, but, to the uh, Guggenheim. And then the Guggenheim will send their shows there. Ah, I see. And so we'll, is it finished? Is it being It's under construction. It's under construction. And we want you to come back and tell us about all the finished buildings. Our time okay. is up. Right. Frank, thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we loved having you, and thanks very much for being with us. Thank you.